Star power and late model stocks. There's a lot of star power in this pro late model field. And we'll start there with Rodney Sandstorm. So there's a lot to keep our eyes on here as we inch closer to the green. Well, and there's a lot of star power that didn't make their way into the field. 14 drivers were sent home packing. We're talking about drivers that have been around the series for a long time. And Zach Fowler, at least in regards to this season, Clint King, Chris Wright, the NQ, a long list of drivers were not able to make their way to the field tonight. As far as drivers who will be starting at the front of the pack, you see Augie Grill, who won the pole. He won the Male Pole Award in qualifying earlier tonight. Katie Hedinger has had such a solid and great race season so far, but has not been able to go to victory lane just yet as they received the one-to-go signal this time from our chief starter, Brandon Willard. Inside of row number two will be that of Ashton Higgins and Corey Heim making a rare pro late model start. will line up at fourth. Dawson Sutton, Connor Zillish, teammates in row three. Ever since the news first came down that the Solid Rock Carriers Cars Tour late model stocks and pro late models will be racing at North Wilkesboro on May 17, 2023, everybody was able to tell that this was going to be the first of many chapters in this track's still to, to grow history. Off of turn number four, racing is back underway at North Wilkesboro Speedway. Augie Grill leads us down for the start. And Grill wasted no time to blast out in front of the pack while Hedinger is up at a second. It appears oh no. that that may not have been the start that the officials wanted, and it leads to carnage in turn three. Again, they called off the start. The yellow flag was out after it was deemed, I believe. I mean, Grill got out to such a lead. I think he may have jumped it early. But this happened after the caution flag was displayed. We don't even score an official lap, and that is what is left of Dawson Sutton. was talking to him yesterday, so excited to be running here tonight and not even going to complete a single lap as I believe he got run into the back of entering turn three when everybody was kind of checking up after that start was waved off. The start for the crossroads, Harley-Davidson, 75, comes to a premature end for not only Dawson Sutton, but I believe that is Brian Kruzak, yeah. who came out at the season opener at Southern National, finished second. We haven't seen him since. The driver at a new market, New Hampshire. It looked as though that he had the speed and poise to contend for a victory tonight, and oh my goodness, it's it was Connor Zillish who got in the back of him, his teammate. And you could see the light, one of the new caution lights that they put out here at this racetrack was out. And I think you hit the nail on the head right there. Connor Zillish, a teammate, as Sutton tries to collect that race car down the racetrack. We'll see it one more time. And uh, you can see him, yeah, he's turning to the right at the last second, but just clips him, spins him around. And unfortunately for Sutton, travels just up the racetrack and is probably okay, but instead makes contact heavy damage on both of those race cars. You could see Sutton and a couple of cars in front of him with their arms out of the window net, signifying that the caution was out, and Zillish just wasn't able to get the memo in time, and that created this carnage with Lee Tissett being the other car that got hit in the driver's side door as Dawson Sutton spun up the racetrack. And boy, to especially when you look at someone like Brian Kruzak, to come all this way, as you mentioned, New Hampshire native, especially still riding a bit of a wave of momentum after the strong run he had for the season opener at Southern National. And for Dawson Sutton, the day of practice, the excitement, anticipation for it to come undone in that form, heartbreaking. So Sutton's car you see there being pushed with obvious damage to not only the nose, but also on the left front of that number 26 car. And Sutton was indicating that he wanted them to stop because he could feel something was not quite right. They're going to have to throw that thing on the hook. However, uh, Cruzek's car was able to, uh, where was still parked stationary there down on the inside retaining wall. No one has been able to go and pick up that machine just yet. And Lee Tissett was able to drive away from the scene after what was a start that was waved off due to the launch that Augie Grill got from the pole. It is so difficult to see those two teammates get together, too. They work so well. I know they get along very well with each other. And, of course, you never want to run into a teammate. I mean, that's the, that's the number one rule of racing. 
just so difficult for those two. And you have to wonder for Connor Zillish, what is the mentality now at this point? And keep in mind, this is a young driver who, number one, has already been voted by his peers as one of the nicest competitors in the pit area, especially in terms of the pro late model field. Uh, local driver out of Mooresville, North Carolina, but we've touched on the versatility of his racing talents. And not only is he the most recent pro late model winner with the Cars Tour, picked up the victory at a Speedway after taking the lead with 25 laps to go in that 100 lap affair. But we also uh, were able to see Connor Zillish be able to have success in the Mazda MX-5 Cup. Went out to Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca. As a matter of fact, now it's known as WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. And picked up a victory there in day one. Day two was running up in the front of the pack until something broke. And then had to immediately shift gears to come back on over to race his Rackley War number 25. And I have to wonder and hope that he could at least shake off what just took place in turn three and have a chance to see what he could do here after he was slated, Connor Zillich that was, to start up in the first three rows. Well, and it's not only you have to put that behind you right now, you have 125 laps a little bit later on in the night if you're Connor Zillich as well. So uh, it's something that you're going to very qu quickly uh, have to put behind and just go forward and, and try to overcome it. And again, this happened at the front of the field too. And again, we talked about how many cars were out here for single car qualifying, how competitive the pro late model field was. It ended up being closer uh, com competition wise uh, than the late model stock field once Brendan Queen decided, oh yeah, I'll run about two and a half tenths quicker than the rest of the field. Uh, but it's just a, a, a tough scene out here. Now again, we did not score an official lap. The yellow flag was out, the restart was waved off, and of course yellow flag laps do not count. Uh, the race leader in Augie Grill had not uh, completed his first circuit around so uh, technically we are still frozen as far as timing and scoring is concerned. And uh, I think the, the next item on the agenda, obviously other than uh, getting Dawson Sutton's car safely back to the trailer, uh, is kind of re-racking this order uh, of what is supposed to be the starting order for this race. And I'm sure that's what's been the conversation with race control and a couple of others is where exactly everybody lines up uh, in regards to the start and whether we're moving up a row or if we're taking Sutton out of the picture and everybody's going to change lanes. That's a really good point to bring up. The timing of the caution and the reasoning for the caution on that first lap does change the way in which we reset the field. Interesting note there, inside of row number four, that black card with the yellow number 27 numerals, uh, that is, in fact, Lee Tissett. He did have Dawson Sutton in the driver's door of that car. Doesn't appear to be too worse for the wear there. Maybe a little bit of a dent there just behind that left front wheel, but he's going to re-rack it and bring that Jeff's Auto Sales entry back up to the inside of what will be row number four and try it again. We'll see if that car can keep up and everybody else behind in this couple of rows uh, going to be important to try and assess the damage on that car. Again, uh, that's a situation with those two cars, the spotter and the team in constant com communication. And, you know, if there's any chance that you're going to repair your car, you're going to want to do it here early on in this race and apparently they've decided that with all the cars we have out here again it's a big ask Eric if you're going to go down pit road it's one thing to do it when we've had you know 20 25 cars in a lot of these fields in the pro late models well, guess what we have 40 now so if you make that decision to turn left onto the pit lane and fix your race car track position 75 to go it's gonna be really hard to get back Let's try it again. The Crossroads Harley-Davidson 75 of the Pro Late Models coming into the start zone with Augie Grill leading us down. Katie Hedinger outside, take two. The honorary starter gets a second shot to wave the green flag. And we are underway and off and running into turn one. Nearly contact in the battle for second as Ashton Higgins tries to slide up inside of Hedinger with Corey Heim ducking to the bottom behind in fourth in the 28 car. The launch is not going to be as big as it was the first time through, but Augie Grill is out to a healthy lead early. Hedinger making the outside lane work, at least for now, to fend off Corey Heim in the battle for third in the Black 81 cars. Hedinger and almost came down with Heim lunging his way there to the inside, now going for second or four. And this is one of the cars watching practice over the last couple of days of Corey Heim was very comfortable. And again, he hasn't been in a pro late model in about five years. And when talking with him about that yesterday, he said, ah, you know what, it'll take 
take me about four or five laps to get back up to speed. And you can see already making up a couple of spots is Corey Heim. Connor Zillish, we mentioned having to put the fact that you spun your teammate out behind you. It looks like he's able to do that. He'll make his way by Katie Hettinger, who honestly with Hettinger, she has had so many fantastic starts in qualifying, but yet the opening laps, it seems like she's drifted back a couple of spots each time which again, we're at North Wilkesboro, exceptionally abrasive surface. You have to imagine for somebody that's been at Hickory Motor Speedway a lot and had so much success there that perhaps that's the thinking for a driver. We talked about patience earlier. That may be what Kate is on Katie Hedinger's mind. And I'm sure that is the message being delivered to that young driver. Patience, 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 but not for Corey Heim who wants the race lead and is looking low. Augie Grill up to the top side. Corey Heim down low, down the main straightaway. They come Heim to the point. And we'd be re remiss if we did not say a special hello to Isabella Robusto, who nearly drove this car to a win at Hickory, still recovering from the effects suffered in that crash. Isabella, we hope to see you back at the racetrack soon. But that car for Wilson Motorsports just took over the top spot. The so grill slots back to third. Ashton Higgins, again, off to a fantastic start here tonight. Had a great qualifying effort a little bit earlier. It's been awfully consistent aside from a speedway and some of the carnage and chaos we saw there is a full moon night, not necessarily the same today. Uh, but you can look at the line that all of these drivers are running, and especially here in the pro late models and talking to drivers in both garages is how these cars really want to run the bottom in three and four. Again, we mentioned some of the patchwork that's been done. Uh, here at this racetrack and trying to preserve this old surface. Well, you can see that it pretty much lines all the way through the bottom of three and four. Talking to these drivers, there's some grip there. If you get right down there to that line, there's a little bit of grip in some of that. Oh, trouble, front straightaway. Got a car hard into the wall just past the start finish line. They were, oh, big hit there for Nick Loden, who nearly ended up over the pit wall. And that's Josh Lauder's car that is destroyed. Just as they came by the start finish line, it was Louder who looked to be in the middle of a three wide situation coming down the main straightaway. And the driver from Archdale, North Carolina, got hooked head on into the wall. And as he came off of the outside retaining wall and started to float his way down, it was Nick Loden who climbed over the left side of his machine. And this may very well be the third DNF in four starts for Nick Loden in that 43. It has been a tough start to the year, and I know with Ryan Wilson's accident at Ace Speedway, we saw the APO sheared off of the left side of that car, but, I mean, just look at the damage on a, a car we can barely even recognize down on the inside. I can't even get a number on the side of that one. So that's Nick Loden there up against the outside retaining wall in turn number one. The white car that was against the inside wall was that of Josh Lauder. We'll try to get a positive ID on the car that was involved up against the wall in turn number one. I believe that was who ended up being pinned between Louder and the outside retaining wall as the red flag is displayed. And Nick Loden is dropping the window net there after what was yet another heartbreaking incident for he and his team. We mentioned the DNF stat, and a lot of that, of course, is not of Loden and his team's doing. Remember, it was at Hickory Motor Speedway. It was still running quite well at the first attempt of a green-white checkered and ended up in a position where they were against the backstretch wall and in trouble. And we'll wait for official word on Nick Loden down there. Trackside looks as though the driver is starting to come out of that course. The good news is Nick Loden, for the most part, does in fact appear to be okay. Just incredibly dejected as he climbs from that car under his own power. Because, of course, it's good to see him climb out. And, you know, you, you kind of called that out of the corner of our eye as they were making their way down the front straightaway. I, I think this was one of the things that is somewhat different about this racetrack since we came here last August. You mentioned the safer barriers that were installed here at this racetrack. We were talking a little bit about earlier the amount of undertaking that that, that was to make sure that this was ready for NASCAR Cup Series competition. In essence, what that did, though, is you could see that this racetrack, particularly on corner exit, a little bit narrower than it was the last time that we were here in August. So I think it's a little more likely that we'll have some situations off of corner exit uh, where I'm sure that that accident pretty much started uh, to where drivers are really kind of squeezed into the outside wall uh, as it was right there. 
you mentioned some of the improvements and enhancements that were being done at this racetrack. I'll credit uh, Bob Pockris of Fox Sports for saying it was an over $1 million investment to add safer barrier around the entire outside of this 5 8 mile oval, as well as the majority of the inside wall that you see here that make up several ends. You can see a lot of it there off of turn number two and down the back straightaway. So a lot was taken under in order to make this racetrack truly race ready for all types of cars that are going to be partaking in contests here at this venue over the course of the next few days. So we wait from official word down trackside as far as the competitors who were involved in the incident here on what happened on lap number seven of the Crossroads Harley-Davidson 75 lapper for the Cars Tour Pro Late Models. 68 laps still to go. Corey Heim is still your race leader. Augie Grill, the pole sitter, is currently running in the second position. Ashton Higgins in third. Good run for Tristan McKee so far, currently scored in fourth. Connor Zillish able to somehow be able to regain composure after the contact with his teammate on the opening few laps, running in fifth. Katie Hedinger, after starting outside of the front row, currently scored in sixth. Lee Tissett, despite the damage on the left side of that car, yeah. when Dawson Sutton came up and right into the side of him, currently scored in seventh. Matt Craig, Mike Hopkins, Caden Quapel, your top ten. We're going to step aside here in North Wilkesboro. We'll be back with more racing here on Flow Racing. Welcome back here at North Wilkesboro Speedway, where we are under the red flag. In fact, the red flag has just been rescinded, and the caution flag is out. Uh, however, we do want to let everyone know that the word from the race control, as well as those down track side, is that both drivers, Nick Loden and Josh Lauder, are okay after what was a very, very scary crash early in the going of the Crossroads Harley-Davidson 75 for the Cars Tour Pro Late Models. Now, uh, from our vantage point, it looked as though, coming off of turn number four, uh, Louder was in the middle of a three-wide fight. Wasn't sure necessarily who was on inside or outside, but it appeared as though he got squeezed into the wall. The scary part was here. Look at this. Oh. Loden, all four wheels up off the ground with a driver's side impact to the inside retaining wall. 
on what was an already destroyed right side of Josh Lauder's car as he ping-ponged his way off the outside wall. And Loden was trying to take advantage of that apron that's down there and just ran out of room simply and nearly jumped up. I mean, they weren't too far from uh, Kitzmiller's car that's sitting down there in the late model stock car pit yeah. lane. Absolutely incredible. Uh, before we get this race re-racked, let's throw it down. Uh, as a matter of fact, we'll hold off on that here and take a look at uh, the front runners here. As there is one car that has not been able to roll just yet. I believe that might be the seven of Tyler Church. And there's Luke Morey as well. A couple of cars that did stop on the back straightaway. Good catch there, Blake, as uh, it appears as though that they may need some push-off or assistance in terms of trying to get their cars back out underway. Luke Morey, who would have thought that he would have to fall back on a provisional after having a hard yeah. time in qualifying? with Church now off of turn number two also. Yeah, you talk about other drivers who've had uh, some ups and downs. Church did roll into Southern National Motorsports Park expecting to race in the season opener and had a motor problem on practice day. This is his first start of the year. And again, just needs a little bit of assistance to get off rolling in that car as we continue to pace around under the yellow flag here at the Pro Late Models. So a bit of a slow getup for the Pro Late Models here on what has been a very anticipated event and race. Uh, this is also, so Blake, as someone who does have some driving experience, I'll be at a Hickory <laughs> Motor Speedway, I have to imagine at a track this rough in this style of car, uh, I view it as perhaps you're straddling a razor's edge for a while until suddenly the handle goes away and typically, you don't get that grip level back. Is that no. what these drivers are pretty much dealing with here at Wilkesboro? Uh, especially if you're loose, Eric, and, and talking to a number of drivers, that's the one thing you did not want to be here, is that if you're, if you're really sideways, you're kicking out that right rear, which we saw a lot of in practice in both divisions. Again, they, they, these guys were practicing the last couple of days in exceptionally hot conditions, about 85 degrees or so. Sun was plastered on the racetrack the entire time that the car store was out there. It cooled off a little bit today, but still was pretty relatively hot conditions. So the one thing that you don't want to be uh, is loose. I know even uh, talking with Dale, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Uh, a little bit last night about, you know, the last thing that he wanted to be is loose. He wanted to be snug. He wanted to be in control because the last thing you want to be, especially uh, with some of the cars that we saw chasing off into turn one, you could look at turn one and some cars were already starting oh, yeah. <laughs> to turn into the corner. That is not something that you want because there's no banking here to really catch it. This track is deceivingly flat um, and even worse so when you talk about the momentum when you're getting down downhill into turn one you're carrying momentum a lot quicker uh, than you otherwise would be going uphill into turn three with these pro late models they're in the chip pretty early on this straightaway or on the, this front straightaway early in the run of course that dissipates a little bit later uh, but yeah the one thing you don't want to be is heating up that right rear tire because it pretty much never going to get it back. Yeah, because once you pay that price, it's paid. You're not yes. getting your money back on it by any stretch of the imagination. You mentioned the characteristics of the front and back straightaway. Sometimes hard to see for fans who are here in attendance, depending on where they may be positioned, or those of you watching along at home on Flow Racing. And as Blake mentioned, there is, in fact, an uphill run on the back straightaway to turn three and a downhill lunge, really, in the turn number one, and that does make the characteristics of this venue, even though from up above or from an aerial perspective, it looks kind of symmetrical, no matter which way you try to cut it in half, that does change the way these drivers have to approach things about the pro and late model stocks, and they got to keep that in mind, especially as they're acquiring data for what they think may be the best setup, but it could end up hurting them in the long run because of the fact they got to do it for 75 laps. Well, again, I think the number one thing these drivers love about this racetrack is the fact that there is so much character to this track it's not the same near the same at both either end of the racetrack and every single time every single lap around is a different challenge for these drivers so the field is getting set for the restart after the red flag was out for a two-car crash where all drivers are okay. Corey Heim, the new leader, took the lead away on lap five alongside the pole sitter, Augie Grill. Into the KRC power steering restart zone they come. We're back underway with 68 laps to go, and Grill is trying to give it a run on that top side. Grill was still trying to keep the fender there to the outside of Heim, but had to concede the race lead as they got into turn number three. And Corey Heim is back out in front. First side-by-side -side battle. Youngster Tristan McKee in car seven. Veteran Matt Craig in the 54 outside. 
Matt Craig, somebody that we're very familiar with in Cars Tour competition, almost contact between the youngster and the 24-year-old veteran, if you want to call him that, made 57 starts in the Solid Rock Carriers Cars Tour Super Late Models, but he has his hands full right now trying to get back down to the bottom. And, of course, one of the newcomers who has taken this series by storm in Mike Hopkins. We saw him do this exact same thing at Hickory at Southern National. Started a little bit further back than your top couple of contenders. And each and every lap we kind of clicked off at the beginning of this thing. You get further and further forward. Mike Hopkins doing that right now. Hopkins still yet to commit to racing for a pro late model championship with the Solid Rock Carriers Cars Tour. I mentioned the fact that his sons are both playing baseball, has been taking everything on a race-by-race -race basis. Meanwhile, one of the other 15s in the field, that red and black number 15 of Brett Suggs outside. Here comes the other black number 15 in the John Blue and Incorporated machine of Luke Baldwin. Three wide just behind him there. Brent Cruz in the 24 making some moves. While the Dennis sets a racing development number six of, um, that would be the number six car. Of course, I had a bit of a brain fade there. That's George <laughs> Phillips, legend car winner. Uh, had the last spot on time in qualifying, did that of Phillips. Happy to make the race, still battling four positions here. And we've seen a number of instances of three wide already off on the front straightaway here in this pro late model race. As you can see, Caden Quapple was so dominant at A Speedway, led the opening 75 laps of that race before turning things over to Connor Zillish, who went on to win. And Quapple, another car that... You know, looking at practice, and he looked awfully comfortable around each end of the racetrack, so no shocker here to see uh, a driver who has found a lot of success here in the Car Store Pro Late Model Series doing so yet again, uh, making his wife by Katie Hedinger. Pretty much single file throughout most of the field. As we say that, battle starts to materialize all across this 5 8 mile oval, including that of Connor Zillish. The lone Rackley War entry still running at this juncture. Coming around here with 60 laps to go, getting inside of Ashton Higgins. And that's going to open the door for Tristan McKee to try to follow through. McKee looking to have himself a better day here this afternoon, if at all possible, for this young driver. In the accelerated development number seven. As a matter of fact, he already has himself one top ten finish this season. It was a tenth at Hickory. Looking to better that here with a top five result, should he be able to maintain his position up towards the front. Again, this is such a spectacular show for all of these fans battling all over the racetrack. You can see the number 27 of Jeb Burton has made his way out here out of Mooresville, North Carolina. Won his first late model race at Ace Speedway in 2011, quite a long time ago, but uh, has made his way out of the racetrack here at North Wilkesboro Speedway. And again, that battle that he is uh, consumed in at the moment, this is for that 14th spot as he is able to make his way by. It's Brent Cruz who is close in tow. Brent Cruz has been a bit of a car on the move. Started back in 31st position. Did that of Brent Cruz already up 16 spots is that of Cruz as he continues to try to work his way further forward. And there's the battle of 15s we were talking about earlier. Luke Baldwin on the bottom in the black 15. The multicolored, mostly red 15 outside is that of Brett Suggs. Baldwin pointed out the fact this is his last scheduled race for Walker Motorsports. Picked up uh, some additional support, pun intended, from Shoreside support and John Blewett Incorporated. Baldwin trying to make the best of this chance here, hoping for more races, if at all possible. And that may make for two 15s. I was talking to Brett Suggs a little bit earlier, who secured enough funding to go through North Wilkesboro, and he said, well, unless a miracle happens, it may not be back out with this TLH Motorsports machine, and what a fantastic job he's done in his few starts, sitting fourth in the points as he loses yet another spot. Uh, to Trevor Sanborn, who gets his way on by, but I may make for two 15s that maybe, uh, maybe not calling it quits after North Brooksboro, but hopefully uh, we'll see you soon. Next race on the docket for these teams will be at the Tri County Speedway on Memorial Day weekend. We'll be looking forward for that one, but we still got the late model stock main event to come and 54 laps to go amongst these two competitors who have pretty much been the class of the field, albeit early on. Corey Heim raced his way up to the top spot. Augie Grill, since giving up that race lead, has not allowed Corey Heim to get too far out in front. Now just behind them would be that of the ace winner and Connor Zillish, but so far these two separated by about a car lane, so a little bit of a bobble there by Corey Heim. That time off at turn two. They are on the sh same straightaway as the tail end of the field, so lap traffic may be a bit of a factor at some point in these next few laps. And it may be a factor, especially when we get down towards the end of this thing. Well, again, we're starting a 
pro late model record 40 cars. So if <laughs> if ever there were a time that you were going to have to deal with lap traffic, it's going to have to be in this race. But looking at these lap times that these drivers are running, not a ton of fall off, and that's for multiple reasons, right? Just 75 laps, not nearly what the late model stocks are running in the Wonder World 125. So not having to save quite as much. Um, it's about four or five tenths of a second or so that these drivers have slowed down um, from their initial starting pace in this race. But granted, we also started this race with a lot of pace laps, so you weren't exactly going to go out there and run uh, some hot laps uh, after the start of this race. We saw Caden Quapel get up to and past Matt Craig for what would be the seventh position. Now Katie Hedinger trying to follow suit inside of turn number one, trying to pin that 54 car up towards the top side of the racetrack. And this may be a point in the race where we really start to see the pendulum shift for some of these racers. Just behind this two-car battle, Brett Holmes, a surprise entry to the Pro Late Model field. He's a former ARCA national champion in that car number nine. He, too, is trying to get up to Matt Craig for what would now be a battle for the ninth position as Hedinger uh, kicks Craig back to that spot. Hedinger up to eighth. I also saw out of the corner of the screen one driver who was making his way down the pit lane, and we can see in front of us in the broadcast with Austin McDonald, who scored. He's only completed seven laps. He's 20 laps now, so another driver who fell out, and he's bringing that number 13. Looks unscathed, but behind the wall, so it looks like a mechanical gremlin uh, befalling Austin McDonald, which, again, tough luck for that driver after... Uh, hasn't had near the start to the campaign uh, that I'm sure he's wanted with the best of 11th at Southern National. Field has just put a lap on car number eight of Rusty Skews, who had to fall back on a provisional to make the show. Skews has been able to keep the nose clean so far in this contest. He will fall one lap off the leaders with more traffic out in front. Joshua Horniman is the next car in line. He, too, unfortunately, had to lean on a provisional in order to make the race, but his family's got quite the history here. His grandfather was a former race-winning car owner in what was the NASCAR Baby Grand Nationals. They picked up a win here in 1974. That family very happy to be back here in the capacity in which they are as the fight for the lead tightens up in his rearview mirror all four. That it does, and Heim trying to find a way around again. The more you get towards this lap traffic, you want to see where exactly they're running, if they're going to be on the bottom, if they're going to be on the top, and you hope that you have situations like this that naturally develop where you're going to be able to make up a little bit of time as Grill didn't have quite the exit he would have wanted off the turn two there at the lap traffic, but Corey Heim uh, very capable and accomplishes any of trying to get by some cars as now they go to the high side around Justin Whitaker, another driver who had to sit on a provisional for today. Whitaker had very high hopes coming into tonight's race, tied for 15th in points after finishing top five in both limited late model races held here last summer. Now you see Augie Grill trying to hook the bottom of the racetrack off of turn number four here at North Wilkesboro Speedway, trying to help that car corner a little bit better on corner exit and maybe not lean on that right rear as much as they are about to come up on Luke Morey in the 49, an Arizona native and front row racing engineer, Dylan Capello in the 11, who gets by Morey there on the front straightaway. That's a battle for position in front of your leaders. Now Morey has to yield. He's up on the high side of Corey Heim. Remember, Morey was trying to get his car rolling after the red flag conditions that we had uh, not too long ago. Remember, there's still perhaps a competition caution for these drivers to look forward to. Again, 35 laps, we would throw uh, the yellow flag for these drivers. Perhaps these top two checking out maybe a little too much. You never know. Their lead currently over third place running Connor Zillish, 2.1 seconds with McKee in fourth position. Ashton Higgins, your top five. So far, Capello, though, has been doing a great job maintaining his position on the lead lap. In fact, he's going to dive to the inside of the number 88 of TJ DeCare, who would be in the 29th position. That's the battle for 29th spot, as Capello now looks inside. You have to wonder if maybe Capello was told, hey, leaders are on you. You've got to pick up the pace now. If you were trying to conserve at this point in the race, there's not much of an opportunity to be able to hold back all that much here. And one car that is struggling big time and off the pace is Brett Suggs in turns one and two. Suggs off the pace, and that will draw the caution flag. Counting the start, this would be for the third time tonight that we have seen the Volt Battery caution. So Suggs, whose car comes to rest up on the outside wall in turn number two, doesn't appear to be any obvious damage to his vehicle. And Blake, you touched on the fact that 
there was some uncertainty about Brett and his team being able to get to Wilkesboro and having what it takes in terms of funding and support just to get here, despite the fact that he came into the night fourth in points. is not the way in which he envisioned his night unfolding, but the hope is that he could get that car refired as he is right now. But uh, I think we penciled Suggs in as someone who would be up in the top ten, and he's just been struggling with the handle on that thing for the last 15 laps or so. Well, again, he's such a hardworking young man, and... Uh, has done anything possible. He runs Brett Suggs Racing Marketing that uh, designs graphics, creates social content uh, for many young drivers, not just himself, and kind of use that as a springboard to work with this TLH Motorsports group and to be able to fund a ride for at least a little bit of time to uh, be able to come out here for the opening races in this series. So tough luck for him, but hopefully we'll see him back soon. This caution comes just a couple of laps before the iRacing halfway break. And it also came at a time in which the leaders were in heavy, heavy traffic as they had caught the tail end of the pack. I will say that the hard racing by that of Dylan Capella is going to offer up the chance for that driver to stay on the lead lap, as will uh, TJ DeCare. And unofficially, Luke Morey should be able to receive the free pass. So the field now circulating under the yellow flag. And since losing the race lead, I've been surprised at Augie Grill's ability to stay with Corey Heim. Thought for sure that maybe this be, this could be a, a shift in pace, if you will. And uh, now I'm starting to wonder if Grill is just kind of biding his time. And let's, let's not look past the experience of Augie Grill in all types of stock cars. This is someone who has been pretty synonymous in terms of success in all forms of stock cars. He is a two-time Snowball Derby winner. Did it back-to-back -back in 2007 and 2008. Three-time Snowflake 100 winner, 2009, 2011, 2016. The racing resume goes on and on. We did see him in the LCQ after the practice times were set for the ASA Stars race, and that kind of put everyone in a bit of a tizzy. But Augie Grill is someone who, whenever you see his name on the entry blank for a pro or a super late model event, the eyebrows raise, and he's proving why. The pace is there, and he has won in this car already once this season. Uh, it actually came earlier this year at the CRA Jags All-Stars event at Watermelon Capital Speedway. So not only does he know how to get it done on the super side, he could win in this very pro late model. He's going to try to do it here in about 40 laps or so, holding steady in second. We're very lucky to have him, and especially so many drivers, the talent that we've had that's expanded throughout this field. It's not just driver. Again, this is the Cars Tour, but with the magnitude of running at North Wilkesboro, having 54 cars, we, we took in teams and drivers from all over the country, up in the Northeast, out in the Midwest, um, even further out, uh, kind of <laughs> way out West. There are just drivers from all over this place, teams who have traveled down, you know, several that were even flying in uh, from Boston uh, to be able to get here and run in this race. Uh, I just think it's a testament to the competition that is attractive for the Solid Rock Carriers Cars Tour, and that's something that we've seen all year long, but never to to this degree for this division. I'll add one more nugget on Augie Grill, sent to us by our friend Bob Dillner, the voice of the Smart Modified Tour here on Flow Racing, who's checking in with us and watching along. In fact, Augie's dad, Frankie, very famous car owner and chassis builder, but Augie also has success as a crew chief. He was crew chiefing when Wayne Anderson won the Derby back in the early 2000s. So thanks for Bob for sending that in to us and passing that along to let the viewers learn a little bit more about a driver who, as we said, his racing resume, I don't know if they make enough paper in order to print down all the success <laughs> that he's had. And he's trying to add more to it here as they hit the Choose V. Uh, this is actually the first time we get to say that. We haven't run a racetrack that has it embedded and printed on the front straightaway like we do here at Wilkesboro. But no surprise, the front row are going to elect inside, outside, as we've seen so far. The car that is slowly working his way up towards the front is at number 15 of Mike Hopkins, who picked outside of Connor Zillish. He'll take you through your first two rows. Again, we have seen the bottom lane be really dominant here. You talked about the choose cone. We saw a choose line, I guess you could say, <laughs> at East Speedway a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but again, one of the few races that we've had where we're, we're clearly going to have one groove that is preferred, at least so far tonight. Of course, the racetrack washed off a little bit earlier, didn't have as much practice for a lot of these cars uh, as we had yesterday. But you can see a lot of cars wanting to line up on that inside lane and decide who wants to take the risk to try the outside. Couple laps shy of halfway into the KRC power steering restart zone they come, and yet another great launch on the outside by Augie Grill. Just about even with Corey Heim for the race lead as they both slide their way off. Turn two for the top spot, side by side to three. 
Grill able to nose out by about a half car length, but Heim powers his way back even as Grill leads that lap at the line. Grill took a really wide entry into one and two. That's going to allow him to have a big runoff. We saw a couple cars try this in practice yesterday. Wasn't so successful, but there's a little more grip out here. Cooler temperatures and Grill doing a masterful job to try to hang on. Connor Zillish starting to creep his way up into the picture as we're side by side yet again for the top spot. The box score will give that lead to Augie Grill at the line that time through. Can't quite clear Heim, but he can off two. Augie Grill, the pole sitter, back to the point. Three cars under a blanket for the race lead. And here comes Heim having a peek down to the bottom. And that's what that battle allowed Connor Zillish to do is to race right up to them. You can see Tristan McGee able to get clear of Hawkins who chose the outside lane and trying to do a lot of what he saw Grill, I'm sure, do a little bit further out the windshield as he's coming back. And even Katie Hettinger had lost a number of spots almost back to 10th. Now she finds her way around Mike Hopkins. So could this be a late race surge for Katie Hettinger who elected to save a little bit earlier on? We're at the halfway point, so perhaps that 81 car has something to say about the second half of this race. The bolt battery caution is out yet again here. Uh, it appears as though something may have taken place. Matt Craig is on the pit lane, not seeing anything from our vantage point at this time, with the field slowing on the back straightaway. But Matt Craig has just pulled down onto pit road, and the team is immediately going underneath the hood. You see it there on your picture. You have to wonder if perhaps something may have let go on a car who I would have put as one of the favorites here tonight, even though this is only his second pro late model start of the year. Again, the two-time champion of the super late model division here in the Solid Rock Carriers Cars Tour when that was running back in 2019 and 2029. Wins along with that and former winner of the All-American 400. And you're right, Eric. I, I think this is one of the cars that we were looking to see up here in the top five and contending for the race win, but clearly something not going right for that number 54. That's off to Craig to be able to get that car to the pit lane right away once he noticed something was amiss, but obviously officials who were stationed around this venue were seeing something they did not like that may have come out from underneath uh, that number 54 from JCR3. Uh, Motorsports, and it appears as though Craig's night may end here with 36 circuits still remaining. A couple of cars going to take advantage of this time to get on the pit lane. I believe that was Lee Tissett in the 27, also the 33 of Dustin Smith out of Mobile, Alabama. Going to try to come down and see if they could do any particular work or handling adjustments on their respective race cars and offer them up a chance to progress in the second half of this race. So Augie Grill back out in front after losing the lead early to Corey Heim, who worked his way on up there. Heim running in second spot. And Connor Zillish in third. Tristan McKee, Katie Hedinger round out your top five. We still have a long way to go, and we are already starting to see a lot of these competitors slip and slip and slide their way around this very abrasive racetrack. Well, and, you know, we look out here and we can see this beautiful paint scheme, which, by the way, went to Victory Lane in 1996, the last NASCAR Cup Series race that ran here at North Wilkesboro Speedway. And somebody that I know a lot of people were looking forward to being in this race, a lot of fanfare around Jordan Taylor or Rodney Sandstorm, I guess you could say, uh, making his start here at North Wilkesboro Speedway tonight. First start that he's ever had on an oval. Uh, had been testing this pro late model at a Speedway uh, in preparation to try to get everything ready for this race. And... Uh, I know hearing of what he had to say yesterday, he was just having an absolute blast out here. And so many of these guys that are coming out like Jordan, like the NASCAR Cup Series stars that we have coming up a little bit later in the late model stocks, they've been enjoying it, but also appreciating the challenge and how good these drivers are in the Cars Tour. And so far, he's getting quite the learning experience. He's been able to keep his nose clean. That's so important here. As we get set to come to the KRC Power Steering Restart Zone, Augie Grill, the pole sitter, back out in front of Corey Heim, Connor Zillish, Mike Hopkins, your front four. 36 laps to go from North Wilkesboro. I'm sure Heim looking to have a repeat effort of what Grill was able to do on the high side. And Heim is still there, not able to get clear. And you can see that outside lane, if you can stick to the high side off of two, you'll build up a little bit of momentum as Heim may try the crossover here off of turn four. 
Heim falls back behind the plane of the rear bumper of Augie Grill's car. Couldn't quite get the launch on the exit of turn number four to dive to the inside of Augie Grill's machine, and the top three start to break free. Mike Hopkins in that 15 did not have the success that we've seen other drivers have on the top side. He will lose a position to Tristan McKee, who has now moved up in a fourth as things continue to tussle about here throughout the bottom portion of the top 10. Side-by-side -side battles continue. Jackson Boone on the bottom in the seven. That's Brett Holmes in car number nine up top. Jackson Boone, somebody that you know, we kind of circled on our list as well. The 2019 Nashville Fairgrounds Pro Late Model Champion is somebody who can run very competitively in this field and continue to work his way forward up into the 11th position just behind Jeb Burton. And again, Hopkins... Slipping back a little bit, you can see Hettinger also able to make her way by Hopkins after that restart as well. The race is really starting to unfolding in a similar fashion to what we saw for Hettinger at Hickory. After starting outside pole, bounced off the wall early in the going and then was able to methodically work her way back up to a pretty solid finish. Ended up six when the night was over. Also came off a top five finish at ace. As the battles continue throughout the pack, a couple of newcomers to the pro late model ranks. That white and red car that you see just entering turn number three now. That is car number two. Uh, and add to this field, uh, John Tyler Bolin out of Jasper, Alabama, making his pro late model debut as we nearly go three wide on the front straightaway. And that's Sanborn of the 44, I should say, in that yellow and black 44, while Seth Christensen bounces off of the other 44 up there in that battle. Uh, that would be, of course, uh, Michael Litchfield. Christensen racing out at... Winder Barrow Speedway in Georgia on dirt a couple of days ago and many of these drivers, they're, they're so busy throughout these weeks and having this race in the middle of a Wednesday, there's not a lot of rest for many of these drivers who go out week by week, nearly every weekend it seems that they're racing and we can have some more probably to look forward to this weekend so for a lot of drivers, a lot of teams very long week but again worth it to race at a venue such as this. One driver we haven't talked about just yet, the white number 14 that is third in line in this freight train. That is Carson Hosevar. NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series winner at Texas Motor Speedway. He's pulling double duty tonight. We'll see him in the super late model later on tonight with the ASA Stars National Tour. But Hosevar slowly starting to work his way further forward. You have to wonder at this point in the race as we start to inch towards the final third of this contest if we will start to see drivers who know how to save their equipment till the latter portion start to rise up towards the front of the running order. Hosevar may be on that list. Oh, that was close. <laughs> Hosevar almost got into the backside of Michael Litchfield as they went into turn number three that time through. Again, so close all throughout the field as you can see Sandburn trying to hold on here off of turn number two. And once again, we've seen kind of this three-car separation up at the front of the field with Augie Grill, Corey Heim, Connor Zillish. See Sanburn here down to the bottom, trying to make his way by that number two machine. He's going to be able to do it. He's way up the racetrack. Bowen's going to yield just a little bit as they come off a of turn number two. Sanborn, another driver who hails from Maine. He's from East Parsonsfield, Maine, driving for Richard Moody Racing. As looks as though you see there as the field flashes by, one car on the pit lane overheating badly. I believe that was the number four of Garrett Smithley for E33 Motorsports, who's going to have to retire with 25 laps to go. Battle for the lead. Heads off into turn number one. Augie Grill, the leader. Corey Heim, second. Connor Zilla still riding in third. Not too far off of the front runners. As they're about to get on the main straightaway as the tail end of the pack once more. Again, this is one of those scenarios we've seen these two jockeying back and forth. And at these racetracks where you have to save so much, it's such a mind game when you're the race leader. And Corey Heim had to deal with it a little bit earlier. How much do you want to save versus how much do you want to push? I think now with 23 laps to go, uh, pushing is more what you're leaning towards, especially considering the fact that we're about to straight away away from the race leaders. You can see some of the lap traffic uh, in Rusky Skews that's a little bit further on. Uh, up the road. It's not too much longer before they catch them, and then you have to wonder if you're Corey Heim, okay, where can I try to set up a pass? Where can I try and set up a move to try and get around Augie Grill as Zillish looks like he's losing touch. He's been a, a little sideways off the corner the last couple of laps, and you can see your top two really starting to pull away from him. While we are coming to 20 laps to go, we're starting to enter that point in the race where drivers can start to envision what it may be like to seal 
the deal. We already told you all that Augie Grill has accomplished in his career so far at this point, but you have to wonder if he's starting to question what it would mean to him, his family. We talked about the history that is attached to his racing family as he slips up a little bit there and turns one and two. That's going to allow Heim to close just a little bit. The pay window is close to opening. The leaders are in lap traffic, and it looks like we may have two cars to settle it, at least for now, with 19 to go and a slide by Heim as he came off a of four. Slide by both of your race leaders and for Grill, he ended a late model winless streak that extended back to 2019 after winning Speed Fest over somebody who's in this field in Caden Quapple just recently and you know getting hot at the right time, but I think you mentioned it. You, you can win a number of times, but I think that thought starts to creep into your head about what it would mean. You see the fans that are still continuing to file in and how sweet it would be to ride that elevator with all this fanfare, all these race fans out here with means so much, but still have 18 laps to get the job done. We touched on the fact that Corey Heim had a bit of a fill-in role for Isabella Robusto, who is recovering. Heim has had some success so far this season on the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series front, trying to get the opportunity to learn this venue for the race that is upcoming for him on Saturday afternoon. What it would mean to bring the trophy back to his race team. Should he be able to get past Augie Grill in the traffic as he is now pinned behind Luke Morey off of turn number four, with Grill starting to open up the gap. Not only opening up the gap, but you can see up the road, not a ton of lap traffic. It's just uh, the 33 on up the road of... Thirty-three at Dustin Smith. It's a little about half a straightaway ahead, but that's really the only lap traffic that is within reach of your race leaders is Zillish is stuck in his home form of traffic. Jackson Boone trying to hold on for a position up towards the front. That's Sanborn of the 44, who has had a very strong run so far here tonight. This position is for the final spot in the top 10. Sanborn on the bottom. Jackson Boone up top off a of turn two. Sanborn trying to get that car wrapped around the bottom of three and four to see if he can get past Boone, who's got a familiar voice in his ears. He's got Brian Kramer, nicknamed Hot Pockets from the New Jersey area, spotting for young Jackson Boone. And all Kramer can tell me is this kid is very talented, fresh off his win at Nashville last week. And he's looking to wrap up what has been a solid night here at North Wilkesboro, just one spot shy of a top 10 as they run. And he's been working everywhere. You can see how quickly they caught the 33 and Smith and a little bit of a gap that Grill is starting to build up over Corey Heim. It's extended a couple of car lengths here these last few laps, but more lap traffic up the road to be crucial for Grill to try to get by it uh, well. And again, a lot of the lap traffic here, you know, they're well instructed in the driver's meeting. If it's not your day, you need to get out of the way and let these leaders settle it amongst themselves. And they're very adamant about that in the car store. And you can see them doing that for Augie Grill whenever he's approached them. It's been easy to go by, but these guys are still racing for some positions and some money as well. And at this point in the race, his Augie Grill had a moment there as he got up to the backside of Luke Baldwin. This is where you're going to start to encounter some cars, especially at the tail end of the pack, that may be a, a bit quicker than what you've gotten by so far. And they also may start to see the handling fade to an astronomical level. Ten laps to go in Augie Grill, and there is a pack of traffic up ahead. And Heim was able to make up significant time that last trip around. Nearly a tenth of a second is what he ran down in Augie Grill, that last circuit around this racetrack. And there is so much traffic up the road. Five, six cars on the same straightaway as Augie Grill. He's going to have his hands full trying to get around all the traffic that includes Rodney Sandstorm. A lot of these cars very ill handling. That's Matt Craig. That girl has just got by. Now Corey Heim looks down low to the inside to have no cars between he and the leader. Kyle Campbell in the 03 just up ahead off of turn number four. That's Litchfield side by side with Campbell in front of your leaders with eight to go. He wasn't able to find his way through the middle. That allows Heim to get down to the inside. They may be side by side down the back straightaway. Eight laps to go and Corey Heim thought about going around but instead they approach Kyle Campbell They'll try to get a run off the top side. You can see the top two cars in a bit of a four-wheel slide as they went off into three that last time through. Campbell takes the inside lane. That's going to force Grill and Heim to go through on the outside. The separation is about one car length between the top two. Connor Zillish a good ways back in third right now, about a half a straightaway with more traffic ahead. Six to go. 
Next up is the North Wilkesboro native and Tyler Gregory, his first race in a pro late model. He'll let the leaders settle it amongst themselves off of turn number two. Corey Heim able to get by quickly, but six laps to go. You have to imagine that, at least for Grill, most of the traffic he's going to have to deal with is behind him. That batch of cars was pretty significant, but now it looks like more smooth sailing ahead as he approaches Jordan Taylor. Taylor going to be the next car in line in his E33 number one here tonight with Heim trying to do everything he can to close up George Phillips just ahead of Taylor as well as they come off of turn number four with four laps to go. It appears as though traffic may have been the great equalizer between Augie Grill, but just as I say that, a slide by your leader as he went down in turn one. That's a couple of times now we've seen him overcook the entry on that downhill run to that first corner, as you mentioned, Blake. Grill may not be sealing this one up yet. And I thought he was going to run away with it, but same slide in three and four. Four laps to go. I may be turning on the pressure here, flipping on the light switch here with three to go. We'll see Grill. He's able to get down to the bottom that time. Gets a solid run off the corner, but Corey Heim is right with him. Just needs another car length or so in the next lap to try to make a move. George Phillips just up the road, running in 20th. Two laps to go. Heim trying to do everything possible as Grill sends it off in the first corner and runs a little bit wide there yet again. Heim is not going to have the exit he wants. He's alongside of Phillips. White flag waiting at the start finish line, settling it amongst these two. Here comes Augie Grill with one to go. Oh, and a big slide with Grill. You can see three wide traffic in front, but don't think they'll approach them here on the white flag. Couple of cars side by side in front of the race leaders. That time Heim with a bit of a slide in turn number one. Augie Grill. With a few more lap cars ahead, comes into the final couple of corners. He won the Malay Pole Award. He's a Snowball Derby winner, a Snowflake 100 winner, and now a winner at North Wilkesboro. Augie Grill wins the Crossroad Harley Davidson 75. What a fantastic battle in the final laps, going toe to toe with Corey Heim. And it is Augie Grill, even though he lost the lead at one point in this race, battled back using the outside lane on one of the restarts and was able to work his way through the traffic to perfection. I think both for Grill and for Corey Heim had nothing left in those race cars as those last couple of laps, both cars really out of whack. They were swatting flies in there, but nevertheless, Augie Grill fantastic drive you mentioned the racing acumen and all that he's been able to accomplish you have to imagine as he's taking these pace laps around he's just going to soak it in as again there are race fans all along the grandstands here and i'm sure he wants to salute them all we've touched on the fact of what this driver what his family what motorsports has done for the grill name and what he has done for his family legacy in this sport I have to imagine, even though the Snowball Derby is one of the toughest asphalt stock car races to ever win, let alone do it twice, I would have to imagine that this moment at this venue that has so much history, which many of us thought we would never see another race of this caliber ever again, let alone what is still to come here throughout the night and weekend. And Augie Grill not only put his name in the record books as the track record holder for the Cars Tour Pro Late Models, we've never run a Pro Late Model event under the Cars banner here before, and he has now become the sole winner in a Cars Tour Pro Late Model event at North Wilkesboro Speedway. And he's going to take that famous elevator ride up to Victory Lane. He'll be the first to do it here, not just on the night, but this week. And I bet that his crew is going to be ecstatic. Can assure with that, he'll take the left-hand turn. And again, it may take him a while to get over there. Again, we have so many trailers, so <laughs> many cars that have been lined up. You can see many of the ASA uh, Stars National Tour Super Lake models that are parked there in one and two. Is, it's like, well, actually, he gets a pretty s smooth drive there amongst all the crowd that has worked their way down, and he's going to waste no time. He's going to drive right onto it. I have to admit, being that it's the month of May, one of the other elevator rides we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, but there's got to be something special about this particular one. And as you mentioned, this is something that maybe should not have ever happened. Many thought it would never happen. We saw the piece earlier that Matthew Dillner and Rob Blount put together about the reason why this week and this venue is so special. And, and also, hats off to everybody who made the decision to keep certain elements. To, as a matter of fact, I'll say most elements of what makes North Wilkesboro special and unique intact 
This victory lane elevator ride, that's one of them. And that is something that Augie Grill is going to remember for the rest of his life for sure. And he won't be the only one who's walking out of here tonight with that memory in that moment. No, he won't. And again, it's not just, uh, I think like you mentioned, it's not just that aspect of this venue. Uh, it's just about everything. The new rebuilt uh, suites that are off in turn four, very reminiscent of course of what has been around this racetrack for a very long time. And, and many of the sign many of the signage, the painting that they've done to the outside, the exterior of these buildings uh, with all the bricks and everything, they've preserved a number of uh, those structures that of course uh, could withstand the elements are still around and even some elements that are they're made to look and give that nostalgic feel are still a part of this racetrack but again none better than this elevator ride for Augie Grill uh, to go into Edelbrock Victory Lane again a moment I'm sure he'll never forget. Crossroads Harley Davidson has been a partner of a race of this nature for quite some time. Victory Lane celebration and ceremony is going to be unique in many of facets and that ride may feel like it takes a good bit, but it's something worth waiting for. Patience has been something that we have touched on and will continue to talk about throughout the night. I have to say, Augie Grill definitely counseled patience there, working his way through that lap traffic, even when Corey Heim was on the back bumper. Margin of victory, seven-tenths of a second, with Zillish rounding out the podium. Great run tonight for Tristan McKee. And Katie Hedinger takes you through your top five as we see Augie Grill getting rolled into victory lane here. In just a few moments, we will have the opportunity to check in with our winner. May take a little bit of positioning in order to get that car exactly <laughs> where they want it. But that's why we have the best of the best up there for sure. And Grill is going to be able to save at this moment. And again, I think so many people around this car, it's not just the driver that makes this happen. You can see many of the family members, the crew members for Augie Grill and this entire team taking the ride up with him. And something that, you know, not only Augie Grill will cherish, but those teams, and those members will as well. How much work and how much effort goes into these cars for everybody involved here as they get to enjoy that ride and a very special night in Edelbrock Victory Lane. As you can see, the movements and motions being taken there in order to try to get Grill in position to celebrate this victory. So many people who make these moments possible here at a venue like North Wilkesboro Speedway. And Augie Grill is going to be able to celebrate with that team. The driver hails from Hayden, Alabama after having a spectacular run. Climbs from the car. That is your winner, Augie Grill, here for the Harley-Davidson Crossroads 75. <laughs> and he is celebrating in a big, big way. <laughs> Hugs and hand pounds all the way around with Augie Grill. You see many of the crew members who come up here, part of that Alabama Brick Racing team, in order to put himself in the famed North Wilkesboro Victory Lane and Edelbrock Victory Lane here for the Cars Tour. We'll have another race and another series that will be coming up. All right, let's check in with our winner, Augie Grill, who's standing by with Jacqueline Drake. Augie, congratulations, man. The smile says it all right there. Hard fought win, though. You had the 28 of Corey Heim right behind you. What was going through your mind? You had a mirror full of a competitor ready to pounce. Yeah, when he passed me there early, I, I was really wanting to ride more than I did, and uh, I felt like he would be good the whole race. So didn't want him to get too far ahead of me there, and uh, I feel like we were out tit for tat. I think he might have let me down there in front of him on that restart. And, I just knew whoever was going to be in the front, it seemed like I was going to win. I, I we were both getting, both getting, we were both getting pretty, pretty loose there. And, and uh, uh, luckily, he got a little looser than me, so I uh, was able to keep it up front. And I'm going to take the trophy on tonight. Not only are you taking the trophy home, but you're taking the pole award and a track record here at North Wilkesboro. Man, you got a couple of Tom Dawson trophies sitting at home. Where does this rank on your win list? Oh, it's up there. Uh, this, this, I mean, I've. You know, I watched racing when I was a kid at this place. Uh, well, saw the last race, the last cup that it raced that was here. So it's 
pretty cool to be up here on top of this concession stand and waving this flag. Uh, it's been a long time coming, and uh, hopefully I'm not done. Congratulations. Put your hands together for your Crossroads Harley-Davidson 75 winner, Augie Grill. Thanks, Jacqueline, and I absolutely love the question. You got a couple Tom Dawson trophies sitting at home referencing the Snowball Derby, and uh, I I'm happy to hear that Augie Grill said that this place is special because it is. It's, it's like watching your heroes play in a particular field that you then get a chance to go out and do battle on. And, you know, we see that in some other ventures. Heck, summer shootouts right around the corner at the Charlotte Motor Speedway, but that's not on the one and a half mile oval. This is the playground where legends and stars were made. And I was surprised to hear Augie mention there. I hope I'm not done. I promise you, the way in which we just watched him wheel that pro late model for 75 laps, he ain't nowhere near done. <laughs> well, especially, I mean, golly, look at that trophy. I mean, that is that is one heck of a piece of hardware right there. When we talk about unique racing trophies, that's about <laughs> that's about as good as it gets. All right, so let's go down track side for a special pro trophy presentation. Uh, let's go down to Jacqueline Drake. Yeah, guys, we have a really cool trophy here at North Wilkesboro. The Call Family Distillers made this copper and wood piece of trophy. It's so cool. I've never seen anything like this. And today presenting the trophy is Mike Lipford, the GM 